Hello, David Zritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. I'm here today to talk to you about one James Bond movie, and that is Tomorrow Never Dies. I know, 1997, a little bit of a, a while ago, but watch check. I'm actually wearing the watch, the screen accurate watch from Tomorrow Never Dies. It was my first Omega watch, so it has a, a soft place in my heart, but there's a soft place in my heart for this movie. And I have a premise, and you're going to have to bear with me on this because the premise flies in the face of many of your rankings. I haven't seen many, if at all, rankings where Tomorrow Never Dies is somebody's number one James Bond movie. And I'm here today to talk to you about a debate, an argument, prove me that I'm wrong, that it may be the number one James Bond movie. And I know what you're saying. David, you're handcuffed to this movie. <sighs> yeah, I may be wearing the shirt and the handcuffs from the bike scene from the movie, but uh, for, for purposes of not dangling, I'm going to kind of get out of these things and talk to you today. This is not opening. Like legitimately, this is not opening. Hold on. All right, now I'm a little nervous. It's the wrong key wrong key. Okay. Wipe my brow with that one. Can you imagine? Danielle gets home and I'm like, honey, I, I, I got locked in these handcuffs. And she's like, who else is here? Hmm? First question she'd ask. But let's get back to the movie because think about all the things that we love about James Bond. I need you to, I need you to set up your mind for this conversation. Think about the fact that we love a really good story. We love a very heroic Bond we love good pithiness and a swarmy, charming James Bond. We love gadgets. We love action orientation. We love a story that moves you through very quickly. Some amazing henchmen, some side characters, a really strong, engaging Bond girl to be a cohort with James Bond. And the bad guy. Yeah, that may be the weak point, but let's let's cover that for a second. First of all, let's bring out Tomorrow Never Dies. This was, as you know, Pierce Brosnan's sophomore outing. First, he had Goldeneye, and then he had this movie, and then he had The World Is Not Enough, which is a little bit more of the From Russia With Love, serious kind of, you know, espionage type movie, turncoat type thing. So Tomorrow Never Dies is sandwiched right in the middle. It's not the Goldeneye, like freshman coming out, coming of age type thing where he's fighting another agent. It is where he's a little bit more comfortable. Even in this movie, Pierce Brosnan himself, he was a little unshaven. He had gained a little bit of weight. He was a little bit more comfortable in the, you know, the middle age James Bond persona that we know and love. But man, oh man, is Pierce Brosnan nailing it. I mean, this is when he is that quippy, having fun type of James Bond. And we have lived through the Daniel Craig era. I need, to, I need to bring up other Bonds and other Bond movies as a premise of comparison. So if you compare Daniel Craig's James Bond to Pierce Brosnan in Tomorrow Never Dies, Brosnan's having a lot of fun. He's brushing up on a little Danish. He's having a go at Q and quipping about his different gadgets. Even when he picks up this watch, you know, he gives kind of a wry smile, that little arch that Roger Moore made so famous. He's doing it in this. He's got the economy of words, but also movements like never before. He really had that in GoldenEye when he would open up doors and then he perfected it in this movie. And boy, can this guy sell action. I know there are stunt guys doing the things like the bike scene with the shirt and everything. But when you see Pierce Brosnan in the action itself, even in the fighting, you know, the sound room, you know, after that whole uh, on air moment where he takes the ashtray, the glass ashtray, and hits the guy over the head. I'm buying into all of that action because you buy into Pierce Brosnan as James Bond. When he walks into a room, women want to be with him and men want to be him. And that's the type of James Bond that a lot of us gravitate to. We're trying to emulate and be inspired by James Bond. He's a very emulatable and inspiring James Bond in this movie. He also gravitates very heavily to the different gadgets, the Ericsson phone, the 
BMW, he connects to them all and uses them to his greatest effect. I mean, look at the amazing garage scene with the BMW chasing around in the back seat, controlling it all with an Ericsson phone. Those are the giddy moments that we love about Bond. Tell me another movie in the James Bond franchise world that has those giddy moments of action and adventure connecting Bond to a narrow, harrowing escape, just narrowing, narrowly getting through with his life against Tomorrow Never Dies. You're going to come up short. There are so many different action moments and it's not action for action's sake. The thing that Quantum of Solace gets dinged on is that uh, ding dong, was it a doorbell? Dinged on is the fact that it seems like the action scenes aren't connected that well by the story itself. It's sort of like, here's a speedboat chase and here's an airplane crash and, you know, here's something else that's going around, a car chase. And in this, though, it serves the story. Remember that? The James Bond story. So they were able to weave all of the action elements. The story of James Bond going through this world with the action moments very successfully. It seems like a movie that's connected from beginning to end. I mean, starting even with the pre-title sequence, the pre-title sequence, it, it really establishes a very mavericky bond, you know, a bond that can kind of go rogue, but he's on a job, he's on a mission, and it also establishes a really strong connection with M. M is not splitting bond apart. Bond is not going rogue against M in this movie. They're very much in partnership and alignment, even with Money Penny. Money Penny is a necessary support, but she's not support part of the action and orientation. She plays her own administrative role, which happens to serve the story extremely well. There isn't a, I call it a Scooby gang, nothing wrong with that, but there isn't in this case. These are just like a military or admin or MI6 person would be, they would be aligned to these individuals. And it works extremely well. We've got to talk about the Q scenes too. We love Q scenes. When we talk about our favorite movies, think, of, think about your favorite movie for a second. Does it have a Q branch scene in it? Does it have a Q scene in it? Chances are it does, and you love it, and you wait for those moments where he gets the gadgets and it's all about the gadgets in the James Bond movies. The ones without, they're fine, but they're not of the pro forma, the synopsis that you think of with a James Bond movie. This one is phenomenal. I mean, they take the mickey out of each other. There's that mutual respect. He gets the gadgets. He uses the gadgets that he gets as opposed to like in GoldenEye when he gets that Z3 and you never see it before. So this elevates the level of gadgets, even to the point where he gets some from his cohort, right? Michelle Yao. And that is a great moment that we need to connect on as well, because is there a better Bond girl that is truly Bond's equal? And every Bond girl says in this movie coming up, the Bond girl is Bond's equal. Have you ever heard of a press event where they don't say that? But in this case, not only is it as equal, sometimes superior to Bond, but not in a way that deflates Bond, not in a way that deflates Bond's relevance or his activity. They play off of each other. They work in a very synergistic way to get the job done. They don't take the mickey out of each other, and it's not at Bond's expense. Even the whole line about it comes from never growing up. I mean, that's us. And that's another point that I want to bring up with this movie, why I think it may be one of the best James Bond movies. And I'm going to give credit where credit's due. Peter Brooker said that Bond, the Bonds that we love, are these empty vessels. Bond is, is, is an empty vessel. He's a machine. He's an engine. And we fill up our own emotional content and personality and personalization into that vessel. And that's why we see us in Bond and vice versa. It's why sometimes we live the Bond lifestyle. But in this case, he's the perfect vessel. He's not this emotional or overly emotional vessel. He's, he's open for us to fill up with our own personalities. And so we can live through and project our world and our life into Pierce Brosnan's James Bond. And that's the other thing too, from a storytelling standpoint, the ending is so satisfying 
but that also sets up maybe just a wee wee coin and that is Elliot Carver. Elliot Carver is the main bad guy in here. You know, he's got his moments. I think he's a lot of fun and interesting. I think he's connected to reality a little bit more. So I would fence with you on whether you think he's a bad, bad guy or a very satisfying bad guy. A lot of people have been saying weak compared to the gold fingers of the world or, you know, obviously Skyfall and some of those, you know, Silva, very strong bad guys. Some people think Elliot Carver a bit weak, but what he's looking to do his maniacal nature and his vengefulness against his own wife. I mean, that's pretty dark. I would submit that he's probably one of the darkest, strongest, most realistic bad guys. So if you take that all into effect and you tie it into one of those moments, you're starting to get an amazing film. And we've got to kind of, I don't know, address the elephant in the room a little bit. This Tomorrow Never Dies is a heroic bond. You are celebrating. You're having fun. You're doing what we call air punching at the end of this movie. Does he save the girl? Well, maybe they save each other. But the big fight at the end and what he's looking to do, he's victorious. And based on some of the new movies, like No Time to Die, seeing a victorious and heroic bond, a bond that goes off into the sunset with a wry smile and looking for fun in all the wrong places, well... That makes us feel great. It's it's what I call a palate cleanser. It's getting back to the fun of Bond that I think, I think with Bond 26, we all want. And that kind of brings me back to my very last argument point with Tomorrow Never Dies. When we sit and talk about the new movie, Bond 26, what tends to come up in these conversations is, oh, I want Bond on a mission. I want Bond to have gadgets. I want Bond to enjoy life and enjoy success. I want him to have great connections with the Bond girls and supporting characters. I want him to have a bad guy that's sort of straddling reality, but also straddling, you know, being bonkers. And I want the formula of James Bond. I want the, the gun barrel. I want the music in all the right places. I mean, David Arnold, anybody? Probably and arguably one of his best scores because it emotionally ties you to everything that Bond is doing. Well, all the things that we say in the darkest corners of every pub around the Bond community and what we want in Bond 26 exists in Tomorrow Never Die. So I submit to you today, reconsider. Why not watch it? It's up on Amazon Prime right now. Watch this movie with fresh and open eyes of what you'd like to see, what you enjoy in a James Bond movie. And I think you might agree with me that at a minimum, it might actually hit the top five for you. Anyway, as usual, I'm looking for your comment and opinion right down below. I'm going to read every single one of them. Tomorrow Never Dies. Could it be the number one James Bond movie? This has been David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll talk to you real soon. Take care. Got to go hide those handcuffs. I do. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.